Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better and safer tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Robert Floyd, uh, who is the Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Uh, this is the organization that's tasked with building up the verification regime of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which is a multilateral treaty uh, opened for signature back in 1996, uh, ultimately where states agree to ban nuclear explosions in all environments for both military or civilian purposes. Uh, prior to joining the organization, Dr. Floyd was the Director General of the Australian Safeguards and Nonproliferation Office, and there he was responsible for Australia's uh, implementation of and compliance with various international treaties and conventions, including the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban, as well as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials, and the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, during the time as Director General of the ASNO, Dr. Floyd also chaired the advisory group uh, to the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency on Safeguard Implementations, uh, co-chaired the Preparatory Committee uh, for the review of the amended uh, Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials, uh, co-chaired one of the working groups in the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, and was the lead official for Australia in the Nuclear Security Summit process, chaired the Asia-Pacific Safeguard Network. Uh, prior to the appointment with ASNO, Dr. Floyd served for more than seven years in the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, where he held a number of senior executive positions, uh, providing advice to the Prime Minister on policy issues covering counterterrorism, counterproliferation, emergency management, as well as homeland and border security. Uh, with a PhD in population ecology. Uh, to begin with, uh, Dr. Floyd spent the first couple of decades of his career as a research scientist uh, with CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. Uh, in addition to his work in that space, uh, Dr. Floyd uh, has been a longtime uh, believer in, in gender equality and the empowerment of women in STEM. Uh, Dr. Floyd is an international gender champion, joined the uh, International Gender Champion Network back in 2021, uh, has been awarded numerous awards and commemorations over his, his career in this area of nonproliferation, disarmament, peace and security. A lot of very interesting and very timely topics to be getting into today. We're honored to have him with us today. Uh, Dr. Robert Floyd, uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. It's a pleasure, Ira. It's uh, great to be here. It, it's great having you. Um, Robert, I would I would love to start off uh, as we typically do by by handing you the floor a bit to sort of talk about the early part of the story because as I mentioned, um, you spent the first couple of decades in population ecology, and I I really enjoy you know going into our guests' uh, publication history and the peer reviewed literature. Uh, there, I was pulling out interesting papers on uh, how rainforest insects uh, affect crops in northern Queensland, Australia, and uh, how this strange little shoot borer devastates the mahogany plantations and all sorts of other interesting things, which are great topics as well for another show. But talk a little bit about your background, a little bit about how you got interested in ecology, population ecology, and then where along the lines you sort of shifted uh, your interest into this theme of disarmament and nuclear, the whole nuclear story. <laughs> I appreciate your extensive research, Ira, into, uh, into my history. Um, yeah, for me, I think I was probably a precocious youth because when I was 12 years old, I went to my father and I said to him, Dad, I want to be a research zoologist when I grow up. 
Um, and so my father, who happen, happens to be a scientist as well, but a botanist, uh, he said, that's great, son. You'll have to go to university, get a PhD, and then you might get a job. And my view was I'd like to work for the CSIRO, our national uh, research agency in Australia. So I went to university, got a PhD, and on the next Monday started with CSIRO, working in areas of animal ecology. Um, so that was a rather directed portion of my life, but I've got to say that from there on it went a little bit more, um, you know, with many twists and turns and less predictable. But my early work was uh, was on population ecology and pest management and even quarantine, you know, which we call biosecurity. And then, yes, you can see the link. <laughs> then oh, yeah. 9 occurred, and around that same time, as you and many of your, uh, your viewers might remember, the um, American anthrax attacks were happening, the white powder incident, so-called. Yeah. At that time, I was asked by the chief executive of CSIRO to coordinate all uh, science and technology across the organization that might be relevant for security purposes. And so that was a new role that I was uh, taking on just because I was working on biosecurity at the time. And uh, within a year of that, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet reached out to CSIRO and asked for somebody to be provided on a secondment into the heart of government, into the Prime Minister and Cabinet Department to help set up a national security science and technology unit to focus science and tech for counterterrorism across the country. I was asked and thought about it for a nanosecond and, and said, sure, I would love to do that. And at the end of my two year secondment, or detail as it's called in the US, uh, I was then uh, approached by the Prime Minister's then national security advisor who said, Rob, um, you can't go, you must stay. And mm -hmm. they created a senior executive position for me because I was working the interface between science, technology, and then policy and politics. And in security, there is so much of science and technology. So I ended up uh, coordinating issues to do with homeland and border security broadly across the country from the Prime Minister's department and was there for seven years. Um, part of the work was looking at chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear um, threats and hazards and, and countering terrorism that could use those means of attack. And the nuclear and the radiological piece then took me into the role of becoming the Director General of the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office. So I went from a practicing scientist for 20 years, a researcher, loved those times, they were great, but I've loved every phase of my career as it's moved on from there uh, to where I am today, heading up a, a UN-related agency, mm -hmm. the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. And the... The CTBTO, you know, is an umbrella organization. So if we look at uh, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, there is an article in it that, you know, after you know, it was created, uh, it says, hey, we're Article 2, we now are going to establish an organization that ensures that uh, our interests, that we don't explode these nasty weapons anymore, uh, on this planet uh, is formed. Uh, this occurs back in 1996. Um, talk about sort of that transition now, sort of, you know, who caught you know, the, the director general of the UN contact and said, Robert, we need you here to, to take on this big role. And we're going to be getting into a lot of interesting technologies uh, in a little bit as we talk through how this all works. But um, talk about how everything got set up from that point on because clearly, you know, the, the seismic monitoring and the, the hydroacoustic stuff and everything we'll be talking about wasn't there on day one. What was there on day one and, and how did you build it all up? I'll just address briefly uh, how I uh, ended up in this organization. Then I'll go back to the beginning of the, this organization. Um, uh, for me, I was nominated by the government of Australia in an election uh, for this position and needed two thirds of the countries of the world to vote for me. And so I'm deeply indebted to them uh, for, um, for their confidence. And I've been in this role now for two years. 
And it's one of the greatest honors and privileges that uh, a person could ever have to be leading an organization for such a noble cause as a ban on nuclear weapon testing for all time, for everywhere, um, and for every future generation. But back to the beginning of the organization. It was probably very soon after the dust settled in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that the leaders of the world started to talk about how can we create a world order where nuclear weapons would never be used. And it was many decades in the making that uh, scientists would get together to talk about these things, but diplomats would seek to find pathways of agreement about limiting the spread and the development of nuclear weapons. The, the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or the NPT, came into being uh, in 1970, and uh, that is the absolute cornerstone to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, and also calls for total disarmament, as well as permitting the use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that the negotiators way back then in the mid to late 60s um, were seeking to get language in that treaty for was a universal ban on testing. And at the time, it evaded them. And one of the reasons that it evaded them is that there was a lack of confidence that you could verify such a ban, that you could be confident that nobody was breaching such a ban. And what happened following on from that is that the, they were unable to get language, so it remained in the preamble of the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, calling for a ban. <clears throat> but it was not then in the operative paragraph, so it didn't become law under that treaty. But following that, the scientists of the world continued to meet. And the scientists of the world continued to look at the challenge of what would you need to put in place to be able to monitor our planet to detect if a nuclear explosion has occurred anywhere, anytime, whether that be in the air, in the ocean, underground or anywhere else. So they were working on that design and a major challenge, you know, somewhat equivalent to putting a man on the moon is to have the technology and the confidence that you could find and detect a nuclear explosion anywhere. And so it was in 1995 that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference called for the negotiation of the CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, to come to a conclusion and to open that uh, text for signature. That happened a year later. And the reason it happened then, but not way back, you know, a couple of decades before, is there was confidence in the science and the technology that a verification system could be established to give every state in this world confidence that nobody is cheating. Nobody is testing when they've agreed not to. And to, you know, ensure this, uh, CTBTO has uh, assembled a, a very advanced uh, technology portfolio, uh, you know, defined as so this international monitoring system. And uh, for everybody that's listening and watching the show, you can go to ctbto.org and check out, uh, you know, what, uh, this system entails, but things like seismic monitoring stations, hydroacoustic stations, radionucleotide stations, um, everything out there, as you say, to, uh, you know, whether it's uh, in the air or underground or under the ocean, whatever, and say, hey, there's something wrong here. <laughs> uh, there's something happening that we need to look at. Um, talk a little bit about how all this gets assembled to begin with. And I, I don't mean to bring up another sort of a recent tragedy, but uh, in the news here uh, recently, you know, um, uh, with the uh, the implosion of this uh, mini sub uh, that was going yeah. to the Titanic uh, last week, you know, we're talking, it, it sort of talked about sort of our U.S. Navy and some of their hydroacoustic stations picking up this implosion uh, in, in, in the wide swath of ocean. Um, how, how does all this fit together in the sense to uh, the C CTBTO Obviously, you have to partner with all the countries out there and their existing infrastructure. How does that all 
get going uh, and set up. Walk us through that one, if you would. The verification system that is set up by this treaty, the CTBT, uh, consists of four different types of technologies, as you mentioned. There's seismic technology to detect vibrations in the Earth's crust, infrasound technology to detect you know, pressure waves and sounds in the atmosphere, hydroacoustics for sounds in the ocean, and then radionuclide technologies to detect the telltale radionuclides, which would uh, tell you that there's been a nuclear explosion. And so we have a network of 321 monitoring stations and 16 associated laboratories that need to be established all around the world. And the careful scientific work done to make sure that the replacement of those laboratories and those stations, most critically, would give us global coverage of confidence to detect any explosion of one kiloton uh, of TNT equivalent or higher. So 321 stations of those four technologies and 16 laboratories is our network, our international monitoring system network, when it's fully in place. At the moment, it's over 90% complete. The data is then beamed up from those stations scattered all over the world and then comes via satellite into Vienna. We receive the data here, we bring the data together, we, we work on the data a little, but in almost real time, the data then is actually being back out by satellite or other means of communication back out to all of our state signatories, all 186 of them. So they then have the data, they can analyze the data, work with that data and make conclusions of what might have happened. Our monitoring system has picked up all of the nuclear explosions that took place has ta have taken place in North Korea. Mm. The first of those explosions uh, was a very small explosion, but our system picked it up. Our system picks up all sorts of other sounds uh, and, and events around the world. And you talked about you know, the tragedy of the, the Titan uh, submersible uh, that was going down to look at the Titanic um, there's a different story that, uh, that we often tell, um, which is uh, even more tragic in some ways uh, because there were many more lives lost. But um, there was an Argentinian submarine that came to grief deep in the southern Atlantic Ocean. And our hydroacoustic stations, there's, uh, there's only a few of them scattered all around the world, but you only need a few to be able to pick up the signal and the direction to be able to locate where a nuclear explosion might have taken place. But when the Argentinian Navy was struggling to locate exactly where the, the, the San Juan submarine had come to grief, our analysts were able to look at our data and to give them the coordinates of where we thought we could pick up an implosion event uh, in our data. And within 20 kilometers of the pin that we gave them, they found the San Juan. A tragic, sad story, but at least it brought closure to grieving people. Um, but Ira, the thing that's amazing is that the two key hydroacoustic stations that came into play were about 6,000 kilometers away mm. of the location. And yet we were able to say within 20 kilometers as to where we thought that implosion, tragic implosion took place. Such is the power and the sensitivity of the international monitoring system. But if you're interested, I could tell you one more story about the sure. sensitivity. Sure, system. please. And this was, you know, detecting a natural event. And uh, you, you may remember on the 15th of January last year, there was a massive volcanic eruption in Tonga, in the yep. South Pacific, the best part of the globe, by the way, yep. the South Pacific, as a parochial Australian. Um, and the explosion occurred with, an, uh, with a submarine a volcano, and then all of the lava is coming up out of that volcano, hitting the water, and there's a massive steam explosion yep. that took place. Uh, a very loud noise and produce pressure waves into the atmosphere, of course, but also in the ocean and some seismic uh, you know, indications. 
But of the, the waves that were in the atmosphere, it actually was the loudest event that our international monitoring system infrasound stations have ever recorded in the 20 years that they established. And so deep in the South Pacific, there is this loud noise. And so then the pressure waves and sound waves from that event then captured in the Earth's atmosphere travel all around the world. And then one by one, our 53 infrasound stations, the lights go on, as they all picked up the waves that were coming from the, uh, the Tonga, Hoanga um, you know, volcano, all of them, even those on the complete opposite side of the world in northern Europe, off into the Atlantic Ocean. They heard it. So as the waves went around and got to northern Europe, they were picked up, and so the signal would be detected, which is amazingly sensitive. But that's not half of it. Because once the waves captured in the Earth's atmosphere got to the other side of the planet, they didn't stop. They kept mm. going. And they went around and around for several days. Some of those pressure waves probably travelled about 200,000 kilometres and were still detectable. That's how sensitive our system is. Although that might be the loudest noise and vibration in the Earth's atmosphere recorded in the last 20 years, uh, that's how sensitive our system is to pick it up from several hundred thousand kilometers away. That's amazing. Not, not just the, the sensitivity of, of these tools, but uh, you know, sitting next to the power of, uh, uh, of nature. Um, you know, we yeah. talk about obviously yeah. nuclear weapons, but there's, a lot of other powerful things that happen on this planet. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it's an, an interesting point to segue to, um, you know, this discussion about uh, so-called dual use uh, of some of these technologies and the benefits that come out of uh, of these networks and uh, that you've developed and, and this increasingly uh, sensitive tools. Um, you know, you, you, you obviously you just mentioned uh, the power of underwater uh, volcano in that case, uh, per the uh, technology portfolio you know some of the things that are mentioned uh, on on the website include tsunami monitoring, which you know uh, obviously um, you know the last couple of decades we've we've seen a an increase in, in those and and obviously for major concern and uh, things that uh, they're very good at damaging stuff just like volcanoes. Um, and, and then you know you mentioned topics like climate change and, and this also. Um, as you're imagining, sort of takes in a uh, uh, a global phenomena, stuff that impacts every uh, you know, corner of the world. Here, talk a little bit about some of these dual use opportunities, um, both on you know the 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 force, <laughs> the ability to pick up and, and predict uh, ahead of time when some of these um, these problems could be occurring. But then also, um, if you could say a couple things, because I know obviously radionuclide monitoring per the, the nuclear explosion side of things is important, but um, other uh, uses of these tools as well, you know, whether it's a, you know, God forbid, a Fukushima type event leaking things where they, they shouldn't belong or, you know, other uh, type situations. Ira, I'm uh, deeply indebted to the drafters of our treaty, the CTBT, that there is a phrase in the text which says that the verification data can be used for other civil and scientific purposes. Yep. And it has. I've given you an example already of the detection, you know, a humanitarian issue of the detection yep. of a, a submarine and its location when it uh, imploded. But there are, are many different areas and it's very exciting to see the scientists of the world and the governments of the world using this data for all sorts of really important purposes. One of those is about natural disaster monitoring, prediction, et cetera. Clearly, because we have such a network of seismic stations, that augments national capacity or provides national capacity in some cases uh, of seismic monitoring where there are earthquake risks. But this same seismic monitoring is also valuable to be able to monitor where volcanoes and volcanic activity may emerge 
and to be able to pick up you know, heightened seismic activity, which may suggest that a, an eruption is about to occur sometime soon. Of course, our data can be used to augment tsunami warning, um, you know, surveillance and, and uh, warning alerts being issued all around the world. And we all became very aware of that following the, the Bandarache uh, tsunami, um, mm -hmm. which resulted in over 300,000 people you know, losing their lives. Um, so we, we have uh, the ability to put in place uh, agreements with countries that have tsunami warning centres that are recognised by UNESCO to then feed in over 100 stations <clears throat> of data uh, from our network to augment the data that other uh, countries might be using. And so that is uh, <clears throat> of great value um, you know, to various countries uh, to augment the data and to have greater precision of their warnings. But the use of the data is beyond just natural disaster monitoring and uh, natural disaster risk reduction. Let me give you an example <clears throat> that appeals to me as a biologist. Um, we're all aware that uh, whales communicate with song, yep. with sounds. And so our hydroacoustic stations placed around the oceans of the world are listening to the sounds within a certain frequency range all the time. And so they're actually listening to the songs of whales, amongst other things. And so cetacean biologists, you know, the specialists that work on whales, have seen this as a treasure trove of data. And just like birds, which I'm very passionately interested in, mm -hmm. birds are characteristic with their calls, so are whales. And so the cetacean biologists can infer, you know, issues around whale movement and, and whale numbers and, and these kinds of things and species distributions from our data. But there were some uh, biologists listening to the oceans the, of the portions of the Indian Ocean, and they heard a different song, mm. a different song. They want to know where it was coming from. Well, that's our normal business, is that we can locate very precisely uh, where a sound is coming from. And we could tell that it was coming from an area near the Chagos Archipelago and a whole new subspecies of whale was discovered based on the songs. Or if you mind one more whale illustration. Please. The pitch of the whale songs in the Indian Ocean is progressively changing over time. Strangely, the pitch is getting lower over time. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do a whale impersonation to you, but, uh, but you can imagine the pitch getting lower of the whale songs. And the question is why? What is going on there? You know, one would, would suspect that it is probably some kind of stress of the whales. And that could be due to the large number of heavy ocean-going vessels that are making lots of noise as they ply their tracks backwards and forwards through the Indian Ocean. Or maybe it's actually stress related to changes in temperature. Whatever it is, we need to understand it because I think it is an early warning signal mm -hmm. that something is not right you know, with the whale populations in the Indian Ocean. So there's a couple of examples as a biologist that I love, but there are, are many other examples of our data being used to explore and understand the characteristics of the structure of the mantle of the earth and the structure of, of the planet that we all stand on. There are others that are, are looking at the physics of, of uh, wave propagation through oceans. And interestingly, wave propagations in oceans are very temperature dependent. Okay. And so you can infer from the behavior of wave propagation through the oceans uh, a measure of average temperature. So it becomes a means to be able to monitor your know, ocean temperatures in a new and different way. And so it goes on. So many different applications. And I'm so glad because, Ira, this network is going to have to be around forever. Yep. Even in a day where there are no nuclear weapons left on this planet, 
the nations of the world will demand to have this network in place so that we can detect if any nation is cheating on its commitment not to test and is seeking to develop a nuclear weapon capability again. Mm -hmm. So it is good for humanity that we see this investment by the nations of the world in our network reaping all of the benefits for humanity that it possibly can. Um, so, so, Robert, you know, obviously we're in a world today where we don't see a, a tremendous uh, amount of nuclear testing going on, uh, except for one outlier, which um, is North Korea. And, and I'd just love to get your perspective on this, sort of a, what we'll say, uh, from using my U.S. vernacular here, a report card on on where we stand with the, with the treaty, uh, how yeah. sort of what nuclear, North Korea does impacts how we feel the treaty is working. Yes. Yeah, Ira, thank you for asking that question because it's absolutely powerful when you look at the numbers that this treaty is such a success. It was open for signature on the 24th of September 1996, a treaty to ban nuclear testing, right? But then from that point in September of 1996, if we go back, back to 1945, over 2,000 nuclear tests took place. But if we take from that point of opening for signature, September 1996, through to now, less than a dozen test events have taken place. And if we look this century, only one state has tested. When I look at those figures, I say that is success. That is outrageous success. One of the reasons that the treaty is so successful is because the verification system, the international monitoring system, works so well that every country in the world knows if they're going to test, it will be found out. And that then empowers what we have as a, a powerful global norm against testing. Almost every state in the world that possesses nuclear weapons has committed to a moratorium on testing. And we are all indebted to them for making that commitment, even though this treaty is not yet legally binding. And we all have a huge uh, peace and security dividend that comes from those moratorium commitments supported by our verification regime and the science and technologists that sit behind that. This is a successful treaty, and I'm so pleased to be working on it. Outstanding. Robert, in um, in Austria, in a uh, a town called Siebersdorf, uh, you have the CTBTO Technology uh, Support and Training Center, where uh, you host seminars and workshops, and you have, I guess, a lot of the tools uh, set up to train, uh, you know, various um, technologists on, uh, you know, the portfolio. Can you just say a few words about uh, the Technology Support Center, sort of what, you know, who trains there, how that all works. And then I know I'm getting you, it, it, per this episode, you just, you're coming off right now of one of the uh, CTBTO uh, Innovation and Technology Conferences, I think last week. If you could yeah. just, I know you're wrapping up on that, but if you could say a few words about, I, I know some of these themes are connected, but a little bit about how that went um, and and uh, what was hot on the uh, the topics uh, there during that conference. Our facility at Cybersdorf, about uh, 45 minutes an hour away from here in central Vienna, uh, is a facility for training uh, activities and support activities. It's also a warehousing facility for parts uh, that we need to support our international network. It's also a facility for warehousing of equipment that would be used for on-site inspection. Mm. Another one of our verification mechanisms where when the treaty enters into force, if there was a claim that somebody has tested, some nation has tested, and it's been disputed, then there could be an agreement to have on-site inspection conducted. And so the equipment required to uh, supply a team to go into any part of the world to detect on the ground for any of the telltale signs of a nuclear explosion, you know, we hold then at the Cybersdorf Centre and we practice and train 
um, you know, surrogate inspectors, you know, that, that would be involved in such an activity you know, when that is, uh, you know, something which is doable when the treaty enters into force. Last week, you mentioned uh, we had our Science and Technology 2023 conference. Mm -hmm. This is call calling out to scientists from all around the world and from any discipline that is relevant or potentially relevant to our activities here at the CTBTO, particularly our verification system. It was the biggest event of its kind that we've ever had. Uh, over 2,000 registrations, uh, over 1,500 of those in person, with over 150 nations represented. And it was such an exciting event to see the diversity of the nations of the world and the specialists from uh, there were 12 different scientific societies that were present and, and you know, engaging in some of the panels. But that, that rich mix of, uh, of culture, you know, of gender, you know, we, we actually had, you know, right on the cusp of 50% of the presentations and panel members were female. Um, so, so proud that we were able to secure, you know, such a strong representation given the general male dominance in science and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we had so many young people, early career STEM uh, people that were presenting and so much excitement about, you know, seeing the progress in our treaty with more and more countries signing and ratifying it in recent years, uh, a very exciting trend, but the technology ever getting better and better. It's part of our outreach to the scientific world to look for new approaches improved approaches that can help us with our mission of detecting a nuclear explosion anywhere, anytime. Uh, a wonderful time and my first as Executive Secretary and uh, and the time I'm not going to forget. And, you know, along the lines, as, as we're talking about um, the themes of equity uh, in, the, in the STEM field, uh, I, I, I pulled up um, the recent uh, annual report of uh, international gender champions, and in the annual report, it mentions uh, specifically you and a program that uh, you began implementing a mentoring program uh, for yeah. early career women in STEM, specifically in the global South. Uh, could you say a few words about this particular program, but also um, a little, you know, uh, the message for the next generation? I mean, obviously, in all these fields, whether it's bio or uh, IT or or, or these are we, we you got to get that next generation interested in doing other things besides law or finance or whatever <laughs> these kids are interested in over here. Um, say a few words about that as well, if you would. A mentoring program. It was an idea that that some of the staff in the organisation came up with. Yeah, they saw a big slogan about you know training is the way to your future, yeah. and they actually questioned that, and they thought, well, actually. Training is necessary, but is not necessarily sufficient for you to get a job and to be able to move forward in your career and recognize that there are many other things that it's helpful for people to learn and influences to have. And, and mentoring became the idea that this actually rounds out somebody's experience. And particularly for us, where we want to recruit the very best in the world, but particularly if they're female and from underrepresented parts of the world, then we want to see excellent candidates coming through and becoming part of our staff. We will always recruit on, on capability. It will be a capability-based assessment, but we want to see these, these other areas better represented. So the mentorship program was set up for early career women uh, from science, technology, engineering, maths uh, in less represented parts of the world. And it's uh, been highly subscribed, oversubscribed. Uh, we're in the second phase at the moment, and we're giving them opportunities to be personally mentored by different members of staff. We're giving them opportunities to get involved in some of the training programs and those professional development opportunities. So it's beyond just your base degree, but it's giving a whole range of other experiences. And thus, we trust is going to be building the pipeline of excellent, talented, young women you know, from the global south you know, that will join our organisation. But if they don't, they will be so much the better for wherever in the world they would go. So that is what it was all about. And if I could just share a, a little story with you from last sure. year, from the Science and 
Ecology Conference. We, we have in the CTBT, uh, we have a youth group. Um, we call it the CYG, the CTBTO Youth Group. It consists of nearly 1,300 people from over 125 different nations. That's a big youth group. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are committed to doing what they can to see a world without nuclear tests. And these are young people. They're involved in advocacy. Some of them are involved in science and technology. Um, but they, they are just wonderfully committed and fired up. They were at their, our conference. Some of them have been at previous conferences. And on three separate occasions, I had this conversation where some of our youth groupies said to me, at the beginning of the week, I wasn't sure I belong here. And then by the time we got to the end of the week, each of them was saying, I now know I belong. And to me, that was such a powerful, powerful message. Some of those have been in our mentorship program. Some of them have been in our fellowship program we, we run. But if we're going to make a difference for this world, not just now, but deep into the future, then we've got to do a really good job at seeing a diversity of age represented in our staff and in our, 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 our spheres of influence. The diversity of gender, yes, but diversity of age as well. And we've got to go that extra mile so that people would know this is where they belong. Uh, I was so encouraged that whatever the magic was of last week at the conference, it caused young people to say, yes, this is where I belong. It's exciting. That's exciting, and I, uh, I, I, the, I, I, ha I think I have, well, I have, I have three kids that live in this house with me, and I have one that uh, I could probably send your way in a couple of years. But <laughs> that was bitten by the <laughs> nuclear theme, so I, I will, we'll talk about that offline. Um, <laughs> what else is um, is coming up? Any, I mean, obviously, you just wrapped up the conference. Any other? major initiatives for 2023, public-facing, future-facing stuff that we should know about, um, other conferences, other talks you're going to be giving, places that we can listen to you, potentially meet you. Uh, anything else you want to mention per C CTPTO or just you <laughs> in general, please take the floor. All right. There, there are many things coming up, but uh, just, just a couple that, that come to mind. Um, is that on the 29th of August each year, it's the International Day Against Nuclear Testing, um, a day to specially recognise you know, the important cause of, of banning and finishing nuclear testing forever. And uh, so as a part of that, I have the wonderful privilege to go and address the UN General Assembly, you know, where they have a special session focused on this International Day and so on the 29th of August, I'll be in New York and we'll be addressing the General Assembly, giving them an update on the real surge of interest and support for this treaty that we're seeing across the world. That's one. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference process also is about to start in the first week of August here in Vienna. Um, this is, it's, it's kind of almost like a parent treaty to our treaty. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is far broader and wider um, and uh, I'll be looking forward to addressing that yeah, preparatory committee in its first session, you know, on in in August. But yeah, many many other places uh, where I will be speaking and participating. But uh, there there are a couple of the big ones that are that are coming up soon. Excellent, excellent. Um... One thing while I have you, I just have to ask because, um, well, at least here in the U.S. in I think three weeks, the uh, the Universal Pictures um, biography on uh, Robert Oppenheimer um, is being released. Um, I, I, I assume you're interested in in, in seeing it, but um, uh, I uh, obviously his story is uh, as the father of the atomic bomb and and everything we're talking about is quite timely. But uh, I. Are you looking forward to it, or are, are you uh, are you going to try to run out and see it right away, or do you not have interest? I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe you're not interested in it, but uh... I, I'm I'm very interested in my and my interest was peaked when recently I was at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Sure, um, you know, one of the places where the the bomb was worked on, and the some of the filming took place there. 
And uh, some of the staff at Los Alamos, these deep nuclear experts, you know, have had some opportunity to uh, input to the accuracy of the uh, of the film. Um, and so they were not letting on too much, but uh, they were telling me enough that it made me very interested to want to see it when it comes out. Uh, so I, I am looking forward to that, to to see you know quite the take you know that uh, that comes out on that. What is really important, uh, Ira, to me is that we need to. We need to make sure that nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon use uh, is not forgotten about. Yeah. It is still a present danger. Yeah, when I was at university a few decades ago now, uh, the banners that uh, student protests had generally were anti-nuclear. These days, it's generally about climate change. Yeah. And I'm not picking winners, but I think we need to keep our eyes on both these big issues. So whether the Oppenheimer movie... Uh, you know, whether it really just crashes through the charts or, or whatever happens, I hope it raises public awareness and thinking about what kind of a world you know, do we really want to have for our children and our children's children and as we go on. Yeah, I, when you mentioned climate change there, I, th I thought you were going to mention AI and, you know, every, everyone, you know, fearful of what AI is going to be doing. But I got to tell you, as a as a child of the 60s myself, um I'm much more afraid of nuclear weapons. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. And, and you know, again, um, I, I, it's so impressive, Robert. Obviously, you know, your story, everything you've been doing and what you continue to do to, to create this future that's free of these horrible weapons. Um, really wishing you and the organization the best with it as you continue uh, to execute upon the charter of, of, of the ban treaty. Um, Again, for everybody that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks or watching uh, with us on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Dr. Robert Floyd, Executive Secretary, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, uh, ensuring a, a future world free uh, of nuclear weapons. Um, Robert, I... Thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while about all these themes. Obviously, thank you for everything you do there at the CTBTO. And as we like to say here on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow and a safer tomorrow for all of us via what you do. A really great story. Thank you, Ara. A pl pleasure to talk to you.